Dr. Lee H. Butler Jr. is our first guide through the pain of seeing and responding to conquered bodies and destroyed lives in our quest toward healing. He is the Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dean and William Tabernay, Professor of the History of Religions and Africana Pastoral Theology here at Phillips. But he's only been here for six months. And since his arrival, he's only had to deal with a major pandemic and all that is meant for teaching and learning in an era of social distancing. And he has only had to do with deal with the effects of the social and political tensions in our nation as they increased anxiety among students and demand constant reflection and response. And he has only had to learn a whole new culture after some 26 years at Chicago Theological Seminary in a pandemic in which the Phillips Building has been closed to everyone but employees and gathering via any method but teleconferencing is avoided. He's risen to those challenges. When he left Chicago, he held an endowed chair as Distinguished Service Professor. And no wonder he was awarded that honor. Throughout his career, he has served as administrator, teacher, scholar, American Baptist pastor, founder of the Center for the Study of Black Faith and Life at Chicago Theological Seminary, one of the first of its kind, in all of theological education. He has served as leader and president of the Society for the Study of Black Religion. He's been author or editor of at least four books, including the one that I'm currently reading, Liberating Our Dignity, Saving Our Souls, A New Theory of African-American Identity Formation. He was well prepared for this work he earned a BA at Bucknell University, an NDiv from Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, a Master of Theology from Princeton, a Master of Philosophy, and a Doctor of Philosophy from Drew University. But here's why I'm commending him to you today. When he's not deaning or meeting all the challenges of our current age, he's working on a book tentatively titled This Violent Land, Religious Experience and the Traumatic Nature of American Culture. When it comes to trauma and destruction in America, he knows what he's talking about. He's lived it, and he's studied it, and he's responding to it, and he's leading us in responding as well. As we face significant historical milestones in the history of this country, not the least of which is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921. As we grapple with the ongoing legacy of racial hatred and violence and genocide, even if only attempted, Dr. Butler brings wisdom, clarity, and experience to these difficult conversations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee H. Butler, Jr. Welcome to this first lecture installment of this year's Remind and Renew. This lecture is entitled, The Spectacle Double Lynching of Laura and L.D. Nelson, 1911. 
the American antebellum period, the Civil War, and Reconstruction were defining moments in United States history. In the late 18th century, the Continental Congress that produced the nation's founding documents was energized by racial attitudes that further developed state laws. In the mid 19th century, the unyielding ideology of white racial superiority divided the nation emotionally, religiously, economically, politically, and geographically. New boundary lines were drawn through secession from the Union and by claiming new territories in the West. This address is a two-part case study of terrorism in the state of Oklahoma that analyzes lynching as ritualized terrorism and sacrifice reenacted for self-preservation. Today, I will present the 1911 double lynching in Okima, Oklahoma. And tomorrow, I will present the 1921 massacre in Tulsa. During the mid 19th century, the land mass identified as the United States of America was divided into three geographical regions, North, South, and West. A line was drawn through the East Coast states in the 18th century the Mason-Dixon line differentiates northern states from southern states. The western region was the new frontier ripe for the taking. Whereas the colonial and revolutionary periods established the frame of freedom, the antebellum period stressed the reign of freedom. Each region embraced its own sense of fulfilling the promise of life, liberty, and property. Regardless of the region, each was framed, informed, and narrated by the concepts and constructs of conquest and freedom. Over time, those geographical regions took on the new ideological labels of the Union, the Confederacy, and the territories. Within America, fighting for freedom from tyranny is regularly justified as a moral act. Therefore, if anyone oppresses you, your humanity is being denied, and you have the right to exercise resistance from oppression. The nation's framers established the fight for freedom to be a sacred act of the human spirit. Freedom was thought to be clearly understood by all who staked a claim and occupied the land, yet freedom is actually an elusive guiding myth. The antebellum period, therefore, was the moment that brought the first challenge to the meaning of freedom. The case study that I'll reflect on today occurred in 1911, Oklahoma. This story, however, begins with the Indian Removal Act of 1830 that established Indian territories in present day Oklahoma. The Indian nations in Southeast Eastern United States identified during the colonial and early national periods as the five civilized tribes were forcibly relocated from their traditional homelands to lands west of the Mississippi in order to make more land available for white immigrant settlers. 
one of the best known identifications of these forced migrations is the Trail of Tears. Because of the thousands of Cherokee, for example, who died during the journey. 67 tribes were relocated to reservations in Indian Territory. Among the five civilized tribes was the Creek Nation. It's important to note that the Creek Nation supported the Confederacy and participated in slavery. When they relocated to Indian Territory, they journeyed with Africans whom they had enslaved. As a result, even before the Dawes Act of 1887, which seized 90 million acres from the Indian nations to give to white settlers, Southern attitudes were present in the Indian and Oklahoma territories, and an ideology of removal was embedded in the region well in advance of Oklahoma statehood. Okima, Oklahoma, the location of this case, is best known as the birthplace of folk singer Woody Guthrie. Okima, originally within Creek Nation, was selected as a site for a city during a railroad survey. It was named for a Creek chief. The city was incorporated in 1903 after Indian Territory was opened to allow for private claim settlement. The land previously dedicated to Indian removal became available to non-Indians, and soon after, Oklahoma was granted statehood in 1907. The county of Ofus Ofuski was organized in 1907, and in 1908, Okima became the county seat. The European American settlers came first as cattle ranchers and farmers with cotton as the leading crop. Later, the town's growth resulted from the oil industry. Nevertheless, with statehood came legislated Jim and Jane Crow laws and the Southerners' ethos became resident and manifest in Oklahoma. Also with statehood came an exponential increase in the number of lynchings in Oklahoma, largely due to the high number of black towns that stood in opposition to the desire to increase the white population. When most people think of Western expansion, rarely is there an image of a wagon train that is made of African-Americans. Fleeing the terrors of white rage that was being experienced in the post-bellum South, emancipated Africans migrated from Southern states westward across the Mississippi to live separate and apart from the violence produced by remaining in close proximity to the governing ideology of slavery. Always believing in their humanity and the liberty ordained by God, they chose to separate from the slavery of their past and establish lives grounded in freedom and self-determination. These free beings incorporated all black towns across the nation and Oklahoma became the home to more black towns than any other territory or state in the nation. The all black towns of Oklahoma established during the reconstruction era overlapped with the lynching era no less than 20 
and upward of 50 black towns were incorporated. Although many are no longer in existence, a number of those towns remain incorporated in the 21st century. One of those towns is Boley, Oklahoma, established in 1903 and incorporated in 1905 within the Creek Nation of Indian Territory. A little known fact related to Boley and black presence in Oklahoma is the dynamics between the Creek Nation and the Confederacy. This means that Southern values and attitudes were resident within Creek Nation Indian Territory. At the conclusion of the Civil War, the Creek also emancipated their enslaved Africans with the dissolution of the Confederacy. The land which became the town of Boley was owned by a Creek freedwoman named Abigail Barnett. Although black towns were the safest place for African-Americans to live with the most liberty, there were those who chose to lease land from white landowners and live closer to white towns. The territory that accompanied, or excuse me, the terror that accompanied statehood dashed the hopes of black residents who sought freedom in Oklahoma. This reality provoked different types of movements within Oklahoma. One set of voices advocated immigration to Oklahoma and another set of voices advocated an exodus out of Oklahoma. A black voice was heard encouraging residents to leave Oklahoma with a resurrected colonizing strategy of going back to Africa or claiming lands in South America. Whites, on the other hand, <clears throat> began to organize themselves into citizen groups and encourage the immigration of whites while simultaneously disenfranchising blacks. Prior to Oklahoma statehood in 1907, the justice that tended to be meted out at the end of a rope was most often for rustlers and robbers. However, after statehood, there was a shift in the social psyche as though the spirit of the Confederacy had possessed the Oklahoman citizen like a legion. Found in the Historical Society of Oklahoma, we have these words. <clears throat> After 1907 statehood, however, lynching entered the most racist phase. In this period, lynching reinforced an existing social order that deprived blacks of political and economic rights and segregated them. The state constitution enshrined Jim Crow and 41 persons were lynched by 1930. Most of these incidents occurred from 1908 to 1916. At the end of the lynching era, the lynching era being 1880 to 1940, Oklahoma ranked number 13 in total number of dead, surpassed only by Deep South and Border South states and Texas." End quote. <clears throat> Lynching is a crime committed with a constellation of sadistic brutality, including beating, mutilating, shooting, and burning the body hung from a tree. A spectacle of lynching is a pleasurable sign of salvation for some while it terrorizes others. For persons who feel 
the American way is being threatened by extinction. It is salvation. For others, it's been a terrorist act intended to control their lives. Lynching has been imprinted on the American psyche as both salvation and terrorism. Lynch mobs idealized their assembly as community protection, self-preservation, and justice, all the while enjoying the thrill of the hunt and the rush of the kill. The lyncher, like the hunter, does not consider his or her kill to be murder. A generalized definition of murder is the unlawful, unwillful, deliberate, premeditated killing of one human being by another human being. Therefore, the hunter and the hunted must be human for the kill to be murder. Consequently, when the hunter kills Bambi, the act is not defined as murder because Bambi is not human. Whereas the cross of Christ mediated salvation for the world, the lynching tree was experienced as mediating salvation for an America charged, or excuse me, changed by emancipation. Lynching black bodies was ritualized in an effort to restore a lost world. It was a prayer to a God created in their own image. Black bodies became the sacrificial offerings to atone for the shame they carried from losing the war and their hope to reestablish a feeling of dominance. James Cutler's classic text, Lynch Law, published in 1905, included a 12-month qualitative chart, quantitative chart, of African Americans lynched between 1882 and 1903. He interpreted inaccurately the higher number of African Americans lynched during the midsummer months to be related to black belligerence and criminality. In other words, Cutler blamed the victims of lynching. His research interpreted the month of July as the growing season and the time of greatest interaction between whites and blacks and therefore the reason for the escalation of lynching. What he did not consider in his interpretation was the salvific and celebratory dimensions of white lynching blacks. July is the month when America celebrates its independence. My reinterpretation of his work is July showed the highest frequency of black bodies being lynched because of the nation's longing to ensure its status as chosen and free. Like gathering for fireworks, crowds would gather for the ritualized spectacle of lynching as a way of reaffirming their vision of America. Lynching, like rape, has been an act of violence to demoralize and control black bodies and souls, to stave off anxiety that is accompanied with feelings of loss, and to reaffirm the walls of separation that provide a sense of security, no matter how artificial the barriers. Within the gospel, there is an analogy made between Moses' work 
on behalf of the people and the crucifixion. When Moses was in the wilderness with the people had, who had been delivered in the Exodus, they came to Moses and they wanted God to deliver them from the experience of the wilderness. They fussed a little bit about that and God not willing to tolerate their disrespect sent poisonous serpents to bite and kill the people. With life and limb on the line, they saw the errors of their ways and they begged Moses to have a talk with God on their behalf. God instructed Moses to take and make a serpent of brass, put it on a pole and everyone bitten who in faith looked at the bronze serpent, would live. The message given to the people, therefore, was the thing that is killing you. If you hang it high and look upon it, you will live. Look and live. Consequently, it's easy for people to believe that if black people are killing their way of life, hang the black body in the tree and they will be saved. As a terrorist act and a form of human sacrifice, lynching has been imprinted on the American psyche as a means of salvation for persons who feel the American way of life is being threatened by extinction. As an act of racial violence, to end ideas of Oklahoma becoming a black state, lynching in the state of Oklahoma must be seen as part of a larger agenda of terrorism by whites against blacks. Mob violence through lynching whipping, massacres, and sexual violation resulted in the establishment of sundown towns that posted billboard signs warning blacks to stay out of town. And I quote, <clears throat> in addition to lynching, racial violence had other manifestations. One was the whipping party in which a large group of whites whipped or beat a black person who was suspected of an offense of some kind. In 1922 alone, according to Oklahoma Governor Jack Walton, 2,500 whippings took place. Another manifestation was the race riot occurring in nearly a dozen Oklahoma communities around the turn of the century, a riot's usual purpose was to run blacks out of town. In Henrietta, in 1907, whites burned the black residential district and established a sundowner law. And in Dewey, in 1917, a similar incident occurred, end quote. The Nelson family, Austin, Laura, and LD, husband, wife, and son, migrated to Oklahoma from Texas. <clears throat> According to the 1910 census report, Laura gave birth to a daughter in Oklahoma. They named her Carrie, and the census recorded her as being one year old in 1910. Newspapers reported different locations for the Nelson's home, 
Some reported locate, their home was located northwest of Bowley, while others reported their home being located northeast of Payton. From these, it can be safely concluded that the Nelsons did not live in Bowley, which was the all black town. Whereas they lived between Bowley and Payton, they may have lived closer to Payton than they did to Bowley. The circumstances and events related to the lynching of Laura and her son LD began May 2nd, 1911 and ended May 25th, 1911. Many details are obscured by missing or contradicting information regarding all that happened. Nevertheless, the story as told should be read as a womanist story. It begins with one Claude Luttrell of Peyton, Peyton reporting a stolen cow. Each of the newspaper articles reported Luttrell's loss as stolen steer or meat. What the record does not report was whether Luttrell was a farmer or a cattleman. Deputy Sheriff George Loney received a search warrant that he executed with others who were sometimes identified as officers but most often identified as a posse. Luttrell was among those men named to execute the search warrant. No record indicates why they searched the Nelson's home. Some reports say the officers found meat in the house. Another says the officers found meat in the barn beneath some hay. It was never reported that they found the remains of a whole cow. Only beef was reported to have been found. And upon that discovery, it was further reported that Austin Nelson, the father and husband, was called out the house where he confessed to killing the steer because his children had nothing to eat. In the course of exercising the search warrant, a muzzle-loading shotgun was seen hanging on a wall. One of the officers reached for the shotgun to unload it, to which Laura Nelson is said to have responded, look here, boss, that gun belongs to me. She's then described as reaching for a Winchester rifle that was hidden behind a trunk or a door. At the same time, LD, her son, reached for the shotgun or a rifle. As he struggled for the weapon or took the Winchester from his mother, a shot rang out, which hit Loney in the leg. Loney crawled out the house as a standoff ensued. In another telling, Austin, who remained in the house during the entire search, took the rifle and stepped outside and attempted to shoot Luttrell. Loney, Loney suffered from his wounds, asked for some water, to which it's reported that Laura shouted, let the white blank die. Loney died in front of the house from his wounds received in the house. Austin was arrested the same night and Laura and LD were arrested the next day. This might explain why Carrie was never mentioned again. Carrie was left with neighbors 
since Laura and LD were arrested at a house other than their own the day after the shooting. Upon arrest, LD was described in the Okima ledger as, quote, a Negro boy who did the killing is about 16 years old, rather yellow, ignorant, and ragged, end quote. All three were jailed in Okima, Austin for larceny, Laura and LD for killing the deputy sheriff. Austin pled guilty to larceny and was transported to the state prison in McAllister on May 16, 1911. <clears throat> and there he served two or three years. On Thursday, May 18, 1911, the Okima Ledger Report titled the article, Negro Female Prisoner Gets Unruly. The paper described the scene or describing the scene identifies her name as Mary Nelson, the name she was often given in other newspapers. In this story, she was identified as Mary, not as a way of stating an alias, rather, she was identified as Mary because that was one of the names that all black women were given under slaveocracy. Here, she was called Mary, resulting from the accusation that she assaulted the jailer, Lawrence Payne, at dinner time. Quoting from the paper, Nelson was bad in jail Saturday night when jailer Lawrence Payne brought up her dinner and when Payne opened the cell door to the woman to eat, she grabbed Payne and attempted to get the jailer's gun. The woman was determined to have the gun, but when she saw that she had failed, attempted to jerk loose and throw herself out a window in the female department. Payne choked the woman loose and after a struggle at the window, forced her back in the cell." End quote. As with most of the details of her story, I suspect this event was not as straightforward as presented by the newspaper. This reads more like Payne tried to assault Nelson for his Saturday evening sexual pleasure. To his surprise, given she was so small in stature, she resisted fiercely to account for his bruising from her resistance he fabricated a story of her attempted escape. Otherwise, why would an attempted escape be described as bad Mary? On May 24, 1911, between 11.30 p.m. and midnight, while the electric streetlights were still lit or had been turned off for the night, a lynch mob numbering 12 to 40 entered the jail through the front door of the sheriff's office. In an affidavit, the jailer Lawrence Payne, a group of men entered the jail, assaulted him with a pistol for the release of the Nelsons, tied him up, and took the mother and son from jail. The lynch mob transported the Nelsons six miles west of Okima to an iron truss bridge over the North Canadian River. 
the July 1911 issue of the NAACP magazine, The Crisis, reported in its crime section, reprinted news from black newspapers. Here's what they reprinted. Laura Nelson, colored, and her 16-year-old son, who were taken from the jail here, dragged six miles to the Canadian River and hanged from a bridge. The woman was the first lynched in the state. She was raped before she was hanged." End quote. Laura and her son LD were lynched from separate ropes on the same side of the bridge. It's reported that the next morning, the bodies of the Nelsons were discovered by a young black boy who had taken his cow to the river. The sheriff was contacted, but before he arrived to remove the bodies, crowds gathered, along with the Okima photographer, George H. Farnham. This iconic photo, perhaps the only woman lynched whose photograph remains in historical record. It is certainly the only photograph of a lynched mother and son. Farnham took a series of photographs of the posing crowd and the lynched bodies from a boat in the middle of the river. There were distance shots and close-ups of the individual bodies. Seen in the distance shot is a group of those gathered to view and be photographed with the lynched bodies. The group was comprised of men, women, and children, but the children are mostly boys. The women and some men are dressed formally, dresses, hats, white shirts and ties. At the far right of the photograph, two men have climbed the crossbars of the bridge to be seen, to be sure to be seen and included in this historic event. There were 58 spectators present in Farnham's photograph, 35 men, six women, and 17 children. The two bodies are hanging approximately four feet above the water. From the distance, the two bodies are facing in different directions. Another close-up picture shows the two bodies facing one another, which means the bodies are twisting in the wind, but more likely the bodies are being turned by manipulating the ropes. What is true of lynching photographs is that bodies were regularly repositioned to pose the body with the crowd. To avoid the effort to turn the body, Farnham and whoever was maneuvering the boat positioned the boat to capture the picture at his desired angle. Look closely at the details of each individual photograph. Mrs. Nelson, still wearing her dress with matching fabric tied around her waist, around her neck, the toe sack is visible like a cape across her shoulders and down her back. She's barefoot. And most importantly, she's still wearing her wedding ring on her ring finger. Her arms are not tied in front of her or behind her, which suggests 
She was already dead before she was thrown from the bridge with the rope around her neck. It was not unusual for lynchers to lynch a body twice just for the fun of it. It therefore is not unthinkable that her dead body would be lynched from the bridge. A close examination of LD reveals the sack still tied around his neck as well. His arms are tied behind him. His pants are hanging at his ankles, covering his bare feet. The photographer, once he developed the photograph, used whiteout to cover LD's genital area. Knowing lynched black men regularly had their genitals cut off as a feature of the ritual of mutilation. It is reasonable to conclude that LD's pants were down because his genitals were mutilated and taken as a souvenir. What possessed these men to remove the genitals of an adolescent boy? He clearly was not being punished for violating a white woman. One can only conclude that this mutilation was part of fulfilling the ritual requirements of lynching black men. Both bodies were violated. Mrs. Nelson raped and LD emasculated before they were thrown from the bridge. Farnham's business experienced a major boom from the Nelson's lynching photograph. In the June 8, 1911 issue of the Ledger, he had a front page advertisement accompanied with a big note of thanks. Quote, I wish to thank my friends and knockers for helping us to handle our latest edition of our photo records. Several of the boys knocked, but we appreciate it as every knock was a boost. The postmaster was worried for a few days, but it's okay now, signed Farnham. The postmaster reference was due to the March 4th, 1909 United States Criminal Code describing unmailable materials. The lynching of Mrs. Laura Nelson and her son, L.D. Nelson, is a story of a mother and son whose lives ended by ritual spectacle designed to recreate the white community through an act of terror. Mrs. Nelson's story is one of a mother who fought courageously to protect her family. Ironically, Mrs. Nelson was described in the Okima Ledger on May 25th, perhaps as a way of supporting the mob, as a very small of stature, or as being very small of stature, very black, about 35, and vicious. Resisting to the end, she nevertheless was unable to preserve her son's life, nor was she able to prevent their bodies from being desecrated in life and made spectacles in death. The details of the crimes and arrests are confusing and laden with misdirection. There was nothing to indicate why Nelson was a suspect. Considering the different, different reporting on which meat and beef was found, no cow was found. It's likely there was really no cow stolen at all, that this was a contrived scheme 
to move the black family out of Payden by newly, by the newly organized White Citizens Club. Furthermore, the number of guns that were reported to have been in the Nelson's house, it's more likely that Austin Nelson and his son would hunt for wild game before resorting to stealing. The most confusing aspect of the search of the Nelson home is the arrest. Given the negative attitude against black families, if the deputy sheriff was shot by the Nelsons in such a cold-blooded manner as described, why would the other members of the search party have allowed the Nelsons to live through the night? If Laura or LD shot and killed Loney, why would they only arrest Austin on larceny that night? How could they only arrest Austin if the deputy sheriff was dying in the Lord Nelson's front yard? There's a story that says LD shot the deputy sheriff because he thought he was going to hurt his mother. Could it be that Austin was arrested and was already en route to the county jail and the men who stayed behind transitioned their search party into a rape party? Under slavery, it was not unusual for white men to rape black women in their own homes with the children in or near the room. If Austin was already taken, this could be why Laura tried to first say she shot the deputy and not her son. This also makes plausible Mrs. Nelson's escape with her children only to be arrested the next day it could be that Loney was wounded by Laura and LD and left in the yard. When other officers returned for Loney, they found him dying. Perhaps that was when Loney asked for a drink of water as opposed to a request for water in the midst of a shootout. The lynch mob that entered the jail was not motivated by the frenzy or hysteria of mob mentality. Had the mob experienced a feeding frenzy, the Nelsons would have been lynched in close proximity to the jail. Instead, the lynch mob traveled six miles outside of Okima. To support this, the ledger noted, and I quote, the work of the lynching party was executed with silent precision that makes it appear as a masterpiece of planning. And its execution was so swift and silent that the town knew nothing of the night work. And even people residing close who heard the tramp of feet thought the crowd of people were going home from a party, end quote. In the weeks that followed the lynching, there were two events associated with the jail that reflected both the prevailing attitudes about African-Americans and feelings about what had been done to Mrs. Laura Nelson. On July 15th, excuse me, June 15th, 1911, the Independent newspaper reported Grace Brown, 14 years old, locked in cell recently occupied by the Negro woman who was lynched by mob. That was the title of the article. The cell 
which recently held Mrs. Nelson is described as, and I quote, foul, gruesome, repulsive, and a general atmosphere of dirt and filth, end quote. Whereas whites and blacks were seen as differing in character, this cell was regarded as no place for white Grace Brown. And I quote, it would be an outrage to lock any woman in the iron cage in which the Negro woman, Nelson, was confined and from which she was so recently torn by a mob and lynched. But to confine this lonesome cell, a girl of tender age, charged with petty theft, it is unspeakably shameful and a blightening disgrace to the county, end quote. Grace's circumstances were contrast with Mrs. Nelson's, and it was concluded that Grace was not beyond redemption. And the Christian ladies should also see that this mistake is never repeated, that no other girl, young girl, is locked up in a dirty cell. It's an outrage against decency to lock a young girl up in the county jail, end quote. It matters not that Austin Nelson was sentenced to two years, perhaps three years, for stealing food. Grace's life, still interpreted by Victorian or Southern genteel values was seen as a victim to be redeemed. On July 13th, 1911, the ledger reported an incident that is reflective of the spirituality of the times as well as the guilt some may have carried for what was done to Mrs. Nelson. The newspaper reported, and here was the title, Seen the Nelson Woman's Ghost in the Female Cell. The janitor moving about the cell area by a lit match, quote, was almost paralyzed with fright to see standing in the cell door a Negro woman clad in long white garments. He knew in an instant that the ghost of the Nelson woman had visited the cell from which she was taken. And as soon as he could move, he started out there. End quote. He tripped over boxes and chairs in his effort to get out of the area. It was later explained that what he saw was another woman prisoner that the janitor was unaware occupying the cell. Nevertheless, a belief in ghost and a fear that the ghost of Laura Nelson might be present to take revenge on, on them was undoubtedly what sent the janitor running. The undenying or the un underlying motivation for labeling the Nelson family as criminal became undeniably clear in months that followed their jailing and lynching. The Okima Ledger ran a series of articles that encouraged the removal of the black population. These articles were published in August, 1911. On Thursday, August 24th, 1911, a front page article entitled, Want More White People and Not So Many Negroes, reveals the segregationist attitudes of many people in Oklahoma. Quoting from the article, there's a movement among the better citizens 
in the west end of the county and in the city of Payton who believe that their community has advanced ahead of the Negro tenant with his log cabin and his mule to an organization among themselves to eliminate, excuse me, who believe their community has advanced ahead of the Negro tenant with his log cabin and his mule to that of a better home and good class farmers. They are affecting an organization among themselves to eliminate the Negro from that selection of the county. And there, and in their stead, get located a good, desirable class of white citizens. Many white landowners are taking kindly to the idea because their Negro tenants, their land has not advanced in value as in other communities and are lending their assistance to the movement." End quote. August 31st, 1911, the ledger ran another front page story entitled, Plan to Shut Out Negro Immigration, which reported the activities of a new organization in Payton Township. This article, more aggressive than the article published on the 24th, quotes from their organizational agreement. For the protection of ourselves and families, and for the upbuilding of a better moral and social citizenship in Oklahoma, we the undersigned citizens and land dealers of Okfuskie County, Oklahoma, do hereby agree, pledge, and obligate ourselves to never rent, lease, or sell to any person or persons of Negro blood or agents of theirs, unless the land be located more than one mile from a white or Indian resident. End quote. Legendary folk singer Woody Guthrie learned of the lynching when he was a youngster from his father, who was reported to have been present for the lynching. Disturbed by what he was told, Woody wrote a song about Laura and, or in his later life, entitled, Don't Kill My Baby and My Son. Viewing the Okima lynching as a ritual of sacrifice, the actions, although horrifying, are strikingly familiar. They're the same rituals of the Christian heritage that are believed to have saving power. And in these cases, they are rituals for the purpose of seeking to save white privilege. The community gathered to profess its faith to the divinity of white supremacy, to claim their faith through public witness and with photographs and postcards to give testimony to their goodness that had triumphed over evil. The sublime terror of the cross became a thing of beauty for the soul seeking grace and salvation. What is more terrifying and simultaneously reassuring than the crucifixion of Jesus? Laura and L.D. Nelson represented for the white people of Okfuskie County their triumph over a black invasion they believed was corrupting their land. In the same way, one might make a sign of the cross for protection 
the white residents of Okfuski County posted and mailed photographs and postcards of Laura's and LD's body as warning and for marking the boundaries of their safety. County Cullen saw the deep similarities between the cross and lynching, which he reflected in his epic poem, The Black Christ, where he penned the sentiment of, quote, God's glory and my country's shame. The passion of the Christ declares, on the same night Jesus was betrayed, he was arrested and beaten all night. A crowd gathered, which has often been described as a mob, to mock and brutalize him as he journeyed the Via Della Rosa, to be spectators of him being hung on a tree. Someone pierced him in his side with a spear. They cast lots for his clothes and he was buried in a tomb not his own. The Nelsons were mocked and brutalized. Their bodies were forced across some distance to a place their bodies would meet their end. Mrs. Nelson's body was pierced with the violation of rape. They divided pieces of LD's body as souvenirs to preserve and remember the feeling of safety. Behold the Nelsons, the scapegoats of God in Okima, Oklahoma, 19. 11.